So to me, that is a really cheering uh, example of what can be done and is being done in this country. Second example uh, is uh, set in Seattle, King County, Washington. It's a whole chapter in, in my book, Hot. And it talks about how, as a community, we're now in a situation where we have got to prepare for a certain amount of climate change, no matter what. Precisely because those jerks lied about climate change in the 90s and blunted the force of, of political action in the 1990s. And we didn't take the steps that we needed to take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the 1990s. Because we waited so long, global warming has now triggered climate change. And that means we're going to have to live with this problem for quite a long time. Now, one quick uh, note of definition here. Probably uh, most of you who just follow this in the media, again, you probably think that global warming and climate change are interchangeable terms. Uh, they're not. Uh, and there's a very important difference. Global warming refers to the rise in temperature around the Earth that happened because of that greenhouse effect, because the heat-trapping gases get up there in the atmosphere and increase the temperature on the Earth. That is global warming. Global warming, in turn, triggers climate change at a certain point, triggers climate change. And climate change refers to the uh, the changes in the climate that occur because of those higher temperatures. And above all, what that means to, and, and without getting too scientifically technical, we're talking about harsher heat waves, deeper droughts in particular, uh, stronger downpours, and therefore more flooding, that all of the, uh, the mechanisms of the climate are going to get more extreme. So even as we get deeper droughts and being here in Georgia, how many people are here from Georgia? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, I mean, the people here in Georgia, you all have experienced this in recent years. Terrible droughts, terrible droughts. And you've also experienced, uh, unfortunately, the blindness of some people who are still climate deniers. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the governor here in response to this drought, instead of saying that we're going to start to take climate change seriously and we're going to begin to look at how we can be less wasteful about our water use, what did the governor here do? You're, you're laughing. It's not... Yeah, he decided that he, uh, he took a page out of the governor of Texas's book and he decided that the way to solve this problem was to have a day of prayer, to invite all of Georgia to pray and that God would perhaps change his mind about this drought. That's climate change, those kinds of impacts. And then, of course, the other big impact that we will see as the temperatures go up is sea level rise. So global warming, climate change. The reason that that's important is that when I was first writing about this problem in 1989, I interviewed Jim Hansen, the NASA scientist who first told the world that this problem is coming. In 1989, all the scientists were saying that, yes, global warming is a problem, but it's a problem, and it's a very serious problem, but it is a problem for our grandchildren. It's going to make this planet a very dangerous place to live in the year 2100. So we better do something about it. Well, you know, who cares about grandchildren, I guess, because we didn't do anything about it. As Groucho Marx once says, you know, they say, if you care about posterity, who cares about posterity? What did those bastards ever do for me? Right? That seemed to be our attitude. Uh, and as a result, another 15 years later, when I uh, started the reporting that led to this book, Hot, was right after Hurricane Katrina hit. And uh, I was on assignment for Vanity Fair in London to interview the top scientist at the British government on this question, David King, who probably you haven't heard of him in this room, but he uh, with the possible exception of Al Gore, David King did more to alert the world's leaders and uh, citizens, especially outside of the United States, to the climate threat than anyone else. And David King was saying that the main thing that has happened now, and this was in 2005, is that global warming has triggered climate change. It has 
we're actually beginning to see climate change now, and this is happening 100 years sooner than scientists expected, than scientists projected. So everything is happening a lot faster. We're now locked into climate change, and that is the single most fiendish fact about climate change, is that there is a lag effect. And this is something that is still not really understood by uh, the media uh, or the politicians, much less the general public. But the laws of physics and chemistry mean that once those carbon dioxide molecules are up there in the atmosphere, they don't dissipate for a very long time. And there's various different times, but, but it's decades uh, before they finally give way. And what that means is that there is this lag effect. So, and this is the way that David King, the scientist, explained it to Mark Hertzgard, the definitely not scientist, uh, is that even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions tonight, all over the planet, which is obviously hypothetical, but if we, all the cars in the United States stop, all the coal-fired power plants in China stop, all the deforestation in Indonesia and Brazil. Stop. All of that. The lag effect means that the temperatures would still keep going up for another 30 years. Now let that sink in for a second. Even if we stopped everything tonight, the temperatures would still keep going up for 30 years. I remember walking out of that man's office that day and walking right down there by the Parliament building in, in London and walking across the, the Westminster Bridge and trying to get my head around this and realizing 30 years, even if we stop tonight, well, we're not gonna stop tonight. Well, how fast could we possibly get off of carbon? Maybe, maybe 20 years with an all-out effort. Uh, so 30 years, 20 years, that's 50 years. Well, that's a long time that the temperatures are gonna keep going up. And I remember as I was saying this that I was about halfway across the bridge and suddenly I heard, hello guys, there we are, children's voices, laughing and shouting. And I looked up and of course those of you who've been to London will know that across the bridge there is that gigantic Ferris wheel, the London Eye. And I looked up and there were little kids who were going around and seeing London and it was, they were shouting and having a great time. But listening to those voices reminded me of something new that had happened in my life, which was that I had just become a father for the very first time. And I was staggered, thinking about 50 years of rising temperatures. And I literally took a step back on that bridge. And I said to nobody in particular but myself, oh my God, Kiara has to live through this. My daughter at that point was four months old, and I saw that she and that other little girl from Bangladesh and two billion other young people on this planet are now looking at 50 more years of rising temperatures and all of the impacts that come with that, the extra drought, the storms, etc. And I said, Kiara has to live through this. And that was what led me to write HOT, and that's also why the subtitle of HOT is Living Through the Next 50 Years on Earth. Because these 50 years are going to be a challenge because of what we've already put in motion by not acting sooner, by letting jerks who lied, who let their greed overwhelm their sense of humanity, and who blocked us from taking action. Because of that, we now have a major, major challenge. We're going to have to live with less water. We're going to have to live with uh, more water in the wrong times. We're going to have to live with sea level rise. And I want to emphasize that my book is mainly about how we do that. 80% of that book is about the solutions to this. And probably the greatest solution, as I say, is, is from, uh, at least in this country, is from Seattle, King County, Washington, where they had the irreplaceable advantage of great local leadership. Not a governor who's gonna to pray to the rain gods, 
but rather a, a, a governor who's going to get down in the weeds and make his government do the right thing. And the, the key thing, and this is something that all of you should be doing in your own businesses as well, is his, his motto was, ask the climate question. By which he meant, find out what the conditions, what the climatic conditions will be in the year 2050, in his case for Seattle, King County, Washington. What's the rainfall going to be? What's the temperature going to be? All of that. And then you work backwards from there to put into place today the steps that you need to deal with that. And so among the things that this guy, Ron Sims is his name, uh, one of the things that he did was to increase the strength of the levees that run through King County. Because as in my new home of California, a lot of the, the water for Seattle comes from snowmelt on the Cascade Mountains to the east, and that, that water uh, melts and then flows down through the rivers to the sea. Well, one of the things that climate change is going to bring is uh, bigger flooding. And so Sims said, look, we're going to have to increase the strength of these levees. And so they did that. And they even raised taxes to do it. They raised taxes, and he got reelected twice afterwards. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that in the United States? Uh, where so many people seem to think of taxes as theft. And I asked him about that. He said, well, we treated people like grown-ups. He says, politicians should try that sometimes. Treat people like grown-ups. I went and explained to them that if we have a flood in this area uh, where this levee runs through, it's going to cost the local economy $46 million a day. And I went there. You can read about it in the book. It's a, an area just south of the airport in Seattle along the Green River. And it looks very nondescript, kind of low, uh, flat buildings. Turns out they're all warehouses. And they supply all of the groceries that go into the city. They supply all of the equipment for a little company called Starbucks. All comes from down there. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Boeing, big companies. $46 million a day would be lost to the local economy if that floods. Compare that to the property tax increase of $40 a year that property owners would, would be hit with. So they went in. They had a lot of, of meetings, much smaller than this meeting, frankly, uh, at the little townships up and down this river. And they explained the, the situation. And people said, OK, well, you know, we're not happy about it, but yes, we, we agree with this. That was one of the things he did, a very simple thing to to say, not so simple to do, he uh, and his government ordered the uh, Port of Seattle to raise all of its infrastructure by one meter, 39 inches, to begin to prepare for sea level rise, to raise the piers, to raise all the other things, one meter. This is something that we failed to do in San Francisco. We just are finishing the, uh, a new um, replacement of the Bay Bridge that connects San Francisco to Oakland. And somebody did not get the memo on climate change because the new bridge, which we just spent are spending $10 billion. All the entrance and exit ramps on the East Bay side are at sea level. So we're going to be ripping that up in 10 to 20 years and, and replacing it. Um, so these are the kinds of changes that, that are needed to make. And by the way, when, when Sims did this, and as you do it in your businesses, and you look through your supply and delivery change, you need to be doing this all the way through. There's a, there's a group called Acclimatize. For those of you who are interested, Acclimatize, A-C-C, -C, Acclimatize, that works with governments and businesses all around the world to, to do this adaptation, it's called. Uh, as you do that, you've got to do it not just in the obvious areas, like levees or transportation. And, and Ron Sims also is doing a lot to to push mass transit and biking and, and all that. You also have to do it in housing. And so one of the things they've done in Seattle King County is that they've started to build housing, including public mixed income housing, in ways that not only reduce emissions, but that also make that uh, community more resilient to the kinds of impacts that come. So they've got, they've built special, uh, I went to tour this uh, community called Greenbridge. And instead of sidewalks and gullies, they've got what they call bioswales, which is basically a, a grass-covered gully. 
so that when the flash rains come, that you can divert it onto these bioswales, and you then store it. Actually, they've got a big cistern underneath the community uh, plaza, and that will then be a source of, of fresh water. So there's a lot of things you can do. You've got to do them across the board, but the main thing is that you've got to see that the job needs to be done, and that we now have to do both sides of climate preparedness. Not just, you know, traditionally it's been if you want to fight climate change, get off of coal, as I mentioned in the first example, go solar, go uh, wind, what have you, and all that's important. But now, because we waited so long, there's a second side, that we've also got to live through the impacts that are now inevitable. And what the scientists call this, the motto that they use is, uh, that must guide us going forward is, we must avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. To avoid unmanageable amounts of climate change, we have got to get the greenhouse gas levels down. We're now up to about 400 parts per million up there in the atmosphere and climbing. We're locked into at least two degrees Celsius of temperature rise over the pre-industrial era. That will bring a lot of impacts. In California, for example, uh, we're going to lose most of the snowpack atop the Sierra Nevada mountains. That's 40% of our state's fresh water supply. And that's going to be gone by the time my daughter's my age, mainly gone. And that's where San Francisco, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Diego, that's where we get our water. It's also where a lot of the rest of the United States gets their fruits and vegetables because the Central Valley of California produces most of the fruits and vegetables grown in the, uh, consumed, I should say, in the United States. And that's all irrigated water that comes off of those mountains. So we have got to find ways to deal with things like that. And we can do it, as I explain in the book. There are ways to do it, but we will never achieve it if we are not clear that that is what we need to be doing now. It's not enough to just reduce emissions. We've also got to prepare for a, what's going to be a kind of a rocky road. So avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. And then, because I think it's, the time is running short, I'll very briefly talk about the third example, which is in Africa, and it is the most hopeful example. Lisa, can you just tell me quickly what time it is? Sorry? It's 20 past 10. 20 past 10. So I'll close in five minutes. Um, so the... I want to talk about Africa partly because it's my favorite place on the planet. <clears throat> I've been privileged to report there many times over the years, and I always find it uh, an exhilarating and inspiring experience. I also want to talk about Africa because there is an assumption when we talk about climate change that uh, uh, that the rich and the technologically privileged are the ones who are going to be best able to manage what's coming. And there's a certain amount of truth in that. It is undeniably true that the impacts of climate change are going to hit the poor first and worst. People in the south of Bangladesh, the farmers down there whose lands are already turning salty because of the sea level rise, and who are so poor already that there's not a lot of margin for them. There's no doubt about those impacts. But this story of Africa and many other stories that I've seen in Asia and Latin America as well in traveling and reporting from, from these kinds of places suggests to me that um, it's not quite that simple. And that indeed, sometimes it's the people who are the poorest who are going to and already are managing this the best. Because one of the things you want to aim for, the experts tell us, in the face of climate change is resilience. Resilience. Well, let me tell you something. People who are living in the south of Bangladesh, who are living in the, in the western Sahel, where this next story is set, they have resilience. They're a heck of a lot more resilient than most of the people living in, in, in uh, Atlanta, or living in uh, Hamburg, or wherever you wish, because they have had to do that. And they also tend to have tighter social networks. And they are able, therefore, to, to take advantage of certain uh, social capital that is harder to find in, in, uh, 
advanced societies. So here, for example, this story is set in, uh, in the Sahel, in, in Senegal, and in Niger, and Mali, and Burkina Faso, where I was traveling last year, two years rather. And uh, you know, these are some of the poorest farmers on the planet. And it is one of the hottest places on the planet. In fact, the day I got to, uh, to Mali, I remember that Timbuktu had the highest temperature of any city in the world that day. It was 114 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and it was January. Needless to say, it's difficult to farm under those circumstances. It is also very dry in the Sahel, which is right there next to the Sahara Desert. And yet, farmers there were fighting climate change even though they did not know the term. Most of them are illiterate. They don't know the term global warming or climate change. They're experiencing the reality. They can describe the reality, but they don't know the term. And with a little help from outside, people like you, they, these farmers were pioneering an ingenious method of dealing with climate change, which was to grow trees. When in doubt on climate change, grow a tree. There are very few things that will do more to help than growing trees. Now, what's interesting about what these farmers were doing, they were growing trees in their fields of millet and sorghum. Now, trees is a relative term. A lot of these trees were closer to bushes or, or uh, shrubs. But the advantage that this gave was enormous. It, and by the way, I'm notice that I'm saying grow trees, not plant trees. They were growing trees, which means that they were allowing the seeds that were already, that the birds and the dung from the uh, cows were dropping, they were allowing those trees and, brush and bushes to grow up rather than cutting them down. They don't have the money to buy seedlings, more, more, nor the water to, to water the seedlings and keep them alive. So they were allowing these bushes and trees to grow up. Why does that matter? Well, because those bushes were, uh, for one thing, the shade was reducing the temperature that the, uh, that the grains had to endure by about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. For another, uh, the trees and, and bushes were holding the soil in place so that when the wind came, it didn't blow the seeds away and didn't blow the soil away. It was holding the soil in place. Above all, those trees and bushes roots were going down into the earth and opening up space down there and ventilating down there so that when there was the occasional rainfall, instead of it flashing off of a very hard soil surface, it was able to soak in deep into the ground. And as a result, you were seeing, and this was tested, I must say I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it, uh, with some uh, local university professors, they had measured over 20 years of, ex of experience with this that the water table had risen by 15 meters. 15 meters. And most heartening of all, uh, we were seeing doubling and tripling of uh, crop production in these areas of the millet and the sorghum, and therefore a dramatic reduction in the number of child malnutrition and starvation deaths. And this is not a small experiment. This is, uh, at last count, when I looked at this about a year and a half ago, we're talking about uh, 12 million to 14 million square hectares across much of Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, uh, Senegal, and uh, the, the uh, scientific source I interviewed on this, a Dutchman named Chris Ray, said that this is probably the greatest ecological transformation underway in Africa. And it is a perfect example of how when you uh, give people the opportunity that they are incredibly resourceful and incredibly resilient. And by the way, this did not depend on huge aid flows from the United Nations or the United States Agency for International Development. This was basically a question of transferring knowledge from one farmer who remembered it from his grandparents because this is how they all used to do it in the old days 
and transferring that to other farmers in the region. And all it took was a German NGO uh, who I think came up with a budget of about $50,000 to hire buses to take farmers from one region that was practicing this method to the next region and to show the farmers there how to do it. And you know, anybody, I grew up on a farm, so any of you who, who, who know about farmers, they're always looking at the, at the neighbor's farm, and how did you do that, and what, you know, and comparing. So uh, farmers will spread that information by themselves, and they have across this wide range. And the, the most beautiful thing about this, besides the reduction in the child uh, malnutrition, I think, is that this method fights both of those problems that I mentioned. It's both avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. It's managing the unavoidable, which is horrific heat and drought. And they are dealing with that through, these, uh, through the trees and the shrubs. But it is also, in its own small way, uh, uh, avoiding the unmanageable. Because every one of those plants is sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And I don't have time to go into it this morning, but that, and maybe Will Allen will talk about this a little bit later, uh, that is, I think, the one silver, semi-silver bullet that we have left in the fight against climate change, is that we've got to find a way to get a lot of that carbon out of the atmosphere. It's not enough to stop putting so much up there. There's 400 parts per million up there now, and look what's happening around the world. We need to get that out. And the safest and surest way to do that is through the use of photosynthesis, something that has been, you know, we're all engaged in it right now and have been all of our lives. As we breathe out carbon dioxide and breathe in oxygen and the plants do the reverse, we've got to find ways to accelerate that. And agriculture and planting trees is the perfect way to do that. So it's very ironic that these farmers, millions of farmers in West Africa, who are the poorest people on the planet, who are illiterate and don't know the term of climate change, they are already way, way out on the uh, cutting edge of innovation in fighting climate change. And it's a perfect example, I think, of, of the kind of, of, um, of great potential that resides in every human being. And if we unlock that potential, what can be done? And my sense is that that's what draws many of you to the work that you do, is to try to unlock that human potential, to believe in that human potential, even though it is often obscured by things like poverty and the, the dismissal by the media and by the politicians. But that is really where our hope lies, I think, going forward. So I am uh, happy to take some questions after this, but I will just close once more by thanking you for uh, listening and for uh, being interested in this, thanking you for all that you are already doing, and by asking you, sorry, to do more. Uh, asking you, not as a journalist, but as a father. I, and many people I know, have devoted their lives to fighting climate change because we believe that it is the big problem and that for me, it's now a personal problem, uh, that the person I care about the most in the world uh, will not have a survivable planet if we don't get off of this trajectory. But it's very clear to me that I can't do it alone, and despite all the successes that we're already having, it's not enough. All these people I've described to you today, those farmers in West Africa, the Sierra Club activists fighting coal, Ron Sims, the county executive in King County, these people are heroes. They're not described as heroes in most of the media accounts, but they are heroes. They are ordinary heroes. And those are the kind of ordinary climate heroes that I hope all of you will become as well. Because as a father, I beg you, please do this. Please do this for the sake of my daughter, for the sake of that lovely little girl in Bangladesh who so much wanted to study. For the sake of your children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and all the young people, they don't know it, but they are counting on us to fix this problem before it's too late. And we can do it, but we need a lot more heroes. 
Thank you very much.